Well, hello, everybody. My name is John Barnwell. I'm here with Dr. Douglas Gabriel for another installment of Interview with an Exorcist. And we're going to continue on in the fascinating trail of this trailblazer of consciousness, Dr. Douglas Gabriel. And he's going to try and share some of the insights that he was able to glean through his adventures. So here we are. Douglas, how are you doing? I'm doing great, John. And uh, in our conversation this morning, you mentioned to me that one of the subscribers had asked a question, and I just want to clarify something. In the last talk that we gave, there were a couple articles below it. In this talk, there will be two chapters from a book below the podcast uh, that you can access. And so if you are getting scared about anything we're talking about, about these beasts that you meet at the threshold or what it's like to go beyond the threshold of death or all these kind of things or when we're talking about exorcisms, if you're feeling scared, you should just relax because there are so many spiritual beings ready to help you. If you are in any need whatsoever, all you have to do is ask. Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. Matthew 7, 7. It's, it's very clear. And so we don't need to worry about that. And if you read these articles that we provide, it will give you more information for the one person I was referring to to begin with that will tell you who it is that is your guide in the afterworld once you go beyond the sphere of the sun. Now, when, uh, when um, Dante wrote about uh, uh, Paradiso and uh, Purgatorio and... Uh, well, you know, hell, heaven, and purgatory. He had different guides that took him through. But one of the guides that you find in many of the different spiritual paths is the being of beauty. And John keeps mentioning strength, wisdom, and beauty. That being of beauty has been lost, and we've changed what beauty is. Beauty, to me, is the great being Sophia, the goddess of wisdom. She's the one who gives us or leads us, takes us by the hand and leads us to the gifts of Christ, which are mm -hmm. compassion and love, of course. So when you're afraid, all you have to do is every night before you go to sleep, remember you're practicing. That's a mini death. Sleep is the sister of death. And the threshold, it's, it's uh, a little bit different between sleep and death, but it's the same spiritual world that you go into. And so we're going to continue to always offer mm -hmm. to you uh, literature that you can read that support what it is that we're saying. And you can also always go to our site and uh, Neoanthroposophy or, uh, and then query any topic that you want. And you'll probably find an article on it. So what we're trying to do here is not scare people. People already see all the evil there is in the world and they're seeing more evil all the time. What we're trying to do is give you the tools to help mitigate it. Yes, excellent. And and keep in mind that there are, are methods whereby you can clear the air, so to speak, in your personal uh, state. Uh, there's uh, visualizations, like visualizing a cross with the circle. That will scare away any demon from the pits of hell. That's what it is. It's, it's the symbol of that great Christ being that is Kyrios. That's the Lord. That's the part of you that, that you don't know about yet. And that's what you've received from Christ through his incarnation. And that's what's going to take us beyond that uh, astral consciousness that we gained before Christ to be able to enter into the uh, I am, the I am. Just so you know that, reminding yourself I am, the I am is just a really good thing. It surely is because whether you're out, like I was just sitting in the sun and the wind is blowing through the trees and you're thinking, well, you know, think about the group soul of the nature spirits that drive the winds. Or think about what comes on the rays of the sun. These are the kind of things that will, in fact, show you that you can change your perception as you're sitting there in that very moment. And your I am becomes what? 
the entire universe. Rudolf Steiner says, if you take the heart, turn it inside out, you'll have the universe. If you take the universe, turn it outside in, you have the human heart. So that's all you ever have to go to. You, you, even when you're looking at your doppelganger, the three beasts at the threshold, all of these different things, demons and so on and so forth, no demon has any power over your I am unless you give it to them. It's as simple as that. Yes, and, and as uh, St. Paul said, not I, but Christ in me. And keep in mind that Rudolf Steiner was adamant in that he said that Christ is infinitely more powerful than the adversaries. So you've nothing really to be afraid of if you allow yourself to take up the armor of God. And so that's kind of what we want to bring to people is a way of taking up the armor of God and being a spiritual warrior. Remember, Paul was from the tribe of Benjamin. They were famed warriors. He was a warrior, and that gave him the courage to be able to surmount any fear and to go into unknown territories to him and to be able to speak the words of the gospel and bring it to all these various peoples outside of the, the community of uh, the Hebrews and the Israelites so that it became a world message. And so that's kind of what we're trying to frame here is to be able to give people a context. Yeah, that's so true. Now, as you know, they used to call me the Scout, the group in Detroit, right? Because every three, every year, three months out of the summer, I'd go basically away from Detroit because Detroit was at that time a pretty dark place. So I needed to rejuvenate myself. So where would I go? Uh, every three months, as you know, I'd disappear during the summer and I'd jump in my vehicle that I could sleep in and I would head, well, I'd head to wherever it was on my list to meet whoever it was I wanted to meet that I'd been making this list for the uh, last nine months. And I'd go meet amazing people. And also Werner in the old days used to take me with him when he would go meet Jean Piaget or Bruno Bettelheim or you name it. He was always meeting amazing people and he always needed a driver. And so uh, I would travel with him and go to these places. And sometimes in the summer, I'd go to the places that he would say, oh, I need you to go to the Santa Cruz Waldo School and then I find out that it's Russell Targ and his group that are trying to start a, a Waldorf school and they need a psychic to find out if this site they want to buy is going to be a hit by the San Andreas Fault, which you can see right from the patio of this school. And so you know, these are the kind of things I'd be sent out to do in the summer. Now, uh, keep in mind, uh, not everybody out there knows who Russell Targ is. So give us a little information about that gentleman because he's pretty fascinating. Oh, well, I think you could probably say it better than me. I, I accidentally ran into them. I met his wife and I'm sitting at his desk and they're asking me after they took me out to look at this Walder school. And I said, no, the San Andreas fault is not going to go off and take this school, even though you can see it from right here. And it's, but this school was surrounded by redwoods. Okay. Very tall, old redwoods. And it was just beautiful and it had two lakes on it. And so I told them, yeah, get the property, whatever. They didn't get the property. But then they said to me, uh, if you can do that, can you help us manipulate silver on the stock market, on the commodities exchange? Because that's what we do to make our money. It's like, oh, so they were into objective viewing. They were into all this stuff. He was into uh, everything, everything cutting edge. He and his group were into, and they were basically the think tank that uh, people looked to. Yeah, just to give you some brief information, he's an American physicist and parapsychologist. He's now, he's 89 years old, but his most famous uh, uh, work is in remote viewing. And he was a part of the Stanford Research Institute where him and Harold Putoff coined the term remote viewing and to be able to see things at a distance. And he worked for the U.S. Uh, Defense Intelligence agency Stargate project. So he's he's a formidable individual in his own right. Yeah. And so I'd meet these people on the way. But every year, as you probably know, I would go to the Sequoia Forest. And from my training uh, <laughs> in the Society of Jesus, they uh, we did word fasts. 
And so I need I needed to spend 30 days out of the year not speaking a single word so that the rest of the year, when I did speak, the words had power to them. And so I'd go to the Sequoia Forest. And I think I went there when I was a teenager at first. And uh, I would sleep inside of one of the burnt out sections of a Sequoia tree. I'd sleep in the tree and it would speak to me. And eventually the tree, I went back there probably 20 times, 14 years in a row, I traveled across America and always made sure I went to the Sequoia Forest. And I don't know, maybe the second year that I was there, the trees started talking to me and I'm going, wow, they, they speak, this is great. So I needed that connection to the elemental force, to the etheric force, to rejuvenate me being in Detroit. It was great all the people that were in Detroit were my karmic group really, and I'll probably speak about that in a minute, but I needed to go out and basically renew myself. And we all need to do this. They call it grounding, put your bare feet on the ground, uh, you know, soak up the sun every day, so on and so forth. Well, for me, I was really very obsessive in those days and I would spend, you know, as long as I could, sometimes in the outback, in the high Sierras. And the trees told me one day, the elixir of life is in our sap. Now, first off, you can't get to this sap. So don't think you should jump on a plane and go out there and get the sap. Cause, and you can't do what they told me to do. I, it took me, I don't know, maybe 20 years to even understand what some of the words were that were told to me. It said spirogenetically separate the sulfur salt and mercury from the sap taken in a certain way, in a certain place, at a certain time, and then merge it with perfect calcium and merge it with perfect iron. And it's like, what does that mean? So literally for 20 years, I meditated on this and I went to every single sequoia grove. There's 30 of them. Every single one of them, because I thought I had to find this sap. Now, I befriended the guy who's the only person at that time that was allowed to cut sequoias if they fell across a road. Now, they don't fall down. These trees are 4,700 years old. Not a one of them has ever died a natural death. Now, it doesn't take a genius to figure out where, where you go with that. Well, if none of these trees have died... Where did they come from? Who crossbred them? Why are they only 4,700 years old and still growing? Why are they the same age as bristlecone pines, which are in, in the valley across from the high Sierras? There's the White Mountains. And across that valley, bristlecone pines grow. Some bristlecone pines grow to be 10,000 years old or uh, maybe older. But these bristlecone pines, because I've been over there, I've studied this for these 20 years or, or for, no, for many more than 20 years. So I went over there and, and I've done all the research on this to find out what scientists know, supposedly. And those trees at the age of 4,700 years old just die. And you know, I'm going, this is bizarre. So you could see the, the dead ones there uh, and then you could see the, uh, and you'd go, but wait a second. So anyone who's out there in, in listening world, you probably then derived the next deduction from this story that I'm telling you, but I'll let, I'll let uh, John chime in. And then I'm going to tell you a bit of a story, which we just wrote two chapters of a book called Immortal Love. And it is a story about these trees. And it's basically a, um, uh, the, as an exorcist, I would sometimes have to look into the past lives of people who were possessed or obsessed or if I'm doing a reading and the person says that they're opening themselves up and I look all the way through their astral body, their third body to their physical body, then I could many times see their previous incarnations, right? When I met John the first time, very strange circumstance, he was wearing a funny hat. It reminded me of a previous incarnation we had together where he, being this warrior guy, puts on a funny hat and it made me laugh so hard that when I started bursting out laughing, because I thought, I have no impulse control. Here's a guy I've never met. He's wearing this funny hat. I'm laughing at him. And in that moment, literally seconds, I saw so many pictures, all, millions of pictures, all the way back showing me some things that we had done in previous incarnations. And because I found it so humorous and the gap between 
that past and the present, I grabbed the hat off his head, threw it on the ground, and started jumping up and down on top of it, laughing very vigorously, saying, this is the ugliest hat I've ever seen. Yeah, it, well, again, we go back to that first time we had lunch together. We went and had Mexican food over on over near Woodward. And we sat down and started talking about Rudolf Steiner's work. And I felt as if I was in front of a big screen TV. As we talk about this, I'm watching uh, literally uh, these images go by, and it was a, it was really an awakening. And and the thing it, that you can find when you develop a philosophical friendship is that the person becomes a sort of sounding board for you, and especially if they're like a couple. Uh, Rudolf Steiner talked about Lawrence Oliphant, who was a world traveler, very renowned, and he talked about. Uh, his books, and, and I have one of them here, but I don't want to start digging things up. But he said that th he was able to write that book because of his relationship with his wife. And when, when she passed away, that the source of inspiration for that work passed away with her. So there's this symbiotic relationship that you can develop through karmic associations that's so critically important. And so you have to be able to be open enough to be able to receive the gifts that can be given to you through the agency of the spiritual beings. Okay. You guys can talk about your dinners and your lunches at Woodward, but I want to let folks know we're going to get into the interesting part soon. We're going to show you how Douglas and I derived a special formula from the sequoia trees that helped us bust a band of uh, energy that had been suppressed by the evil one so that we couldn't get past the ceiling to get higher into our, um, what do I want to say, Doug Douglas, the, the spiritual essence of who we were is being blocked. So we knew we needed to find that vibrational band and it didn't exist in our world. So when we first met, Douglas talked about the sequoia trees on and on and on. He's always talking about them. I said, okay, let's go out there and see the sequoia trees, but let's go with the purpose because we always do things with a purpose and let's go and let's see if we can find some sequoia sap. So I'll let you continue that story, Douglas, and get you guys out of the diner at Woodward Avenue and into the sequoia forest. Which is so much nicer than the Como Cafe. Uh, so yes, well, as Tyler just said, that, but there's so much to preface for this, for you to fully understand the impact of what she just showed you, okay? If you got what I just said, what she just showed you should have freaked you out because then you just looked at an elixir of life. Now, we didn't know whether if I followed the instructions and I didn't know until Tyla as a naturopathic doctor helped me understand how I could even do this process. And so what good did it do me to have this in my head all these years looking for the sequoia sap? I went to every single one. And uh, I don't know how many times, two dozen times. But when she said, why is it you want to go to the sequoia for it? Or what's this thing about the sequoia for us? I said, well, and then I started telling her this story of how I think somehow I'm connected to planting those trees. And that sounded crazy. And she goes, okay, let's do something. So at the time I could barely walk. So I had to work up to practicing to go hiking because we we're going to go up the mountain five miles in because there was one little teensy tiny strip about a half a mile long, which had just a few sequoias on it that I had not walked on because when I had walked that trail before, it was a spur and I didn't go on it. And I thought, look, I that was very late into this out, you know, I'd been there 20 times already. So I kind of was giving up. There was no way to get, to get sap out of the tree in the way that I needed to, even though I was talking to the guy who was the only guy who got to cut sequoia trees and he promised he'd get me some never happened. So all these years I tried and tried and tried and tried. Then, and, and Tyler says, let's do this. I'm thinking I've already tried this for dozens of years. I mean, for dozens of times, she goes, no, we're going to go and we're going to accomplish our task. It's like, okay. And then it started coming, things started coming back to me. So we prepared to go on this trip 
And we went there and we went to Calaveras Big Big Tree, which a lot of people don't even know is a sequoia forest. And we went to this trail and then at where the spur starts off, we were going down this spur and, and we walked down about the half mile. And in the end, you could see where the forest ended and there was one tree. And I looked at her and I said, oh my heavens, do you see the tree in front of us? It had the biggest wound of any sequoia that I've ever seen. The whole inside, there was a tunnel through it. It was still alive, perfectly healthy, but it, uh, you could probably fit 25 people inside of the opening that was burnt from lightning. You know, sequoias have asbestos in the bark, so they resist lightning, but their cambium, uh, cambium can burn. So it had burnt, but it just happened to leave a wound that bled fresh sequoia sap. So we got some, and that was the first time in all my life since I was probably 16 years old, maybe 17. All the times I'd been there, all the times I was trying to do the bidding of these elemental beings, speaking through these trees, saying, this is there. But see, then it came to light what really happened. And if you want to read the story about Tyler and I going to the Sequoia Forest and what happened, you can read it in one of the, the first chapter. If you want to read about how it is that she, as a botanist in a previous incarnation, and I was on that, I, I was like, um, I was a horse breeder actually in that incarnation. And I was just, I was on this expedition. And what we found out through each other is what Steiner points out. You find out about your previous incarnations through other people. You can strive your whole life to figure it out I traveled to as many of these places because I was stupid and, and I didn't know that Steiner had said this. And so I eventually did read Steiner saying, going to where you were previously incarnated and trying to pick up your past path is not doesn't work. As a matter of fact, it's practically a hindrance to you. So Tyla and I, we hadn't met, though I had been trying to meet this person. So we figured out later after we met through a very strange circumstance that we had been in the same room together at least a well, half This a dozen is about times. as boring as y'all having dinner at the cafe. So I want to get to the fun stuff. Let's talk about this elixir of life and how we came up with it. Okay. Because it's very interesting. So when, when I met Douglas, now imagine first date, what does he talk about? He talks about the Sequoia Forest. He talks about narwhal tusk and meteorites and on and on it went in a loop. So we go to the Sequoia Forest. We knew that we had to get some sap because he said he's got this idea of how you separate it out and sulfur and this and that. But you see, that's not going to be practical. You can't go in there and harvest sap. It was very difficult to, for us to even find a little drop, we, just a little drop. What we had to do is we had to work on this vibrationally. We had to take the vibration of the Sequoia sap and then find a way to integrate it into ourselves. But Douglas also felt that it should be balanced because the sequoia is silica, this beautiful, perfect silica. And that's the force that causes us to ascend and to stand upright. But we also had to balance it with calcium. Well, there came the nor narwhal tusk because it is the perfect calcium for our use. And then, of course, the meteorite. Mm, I'm not really not sure now why we did the meteorite. Maybe like adding a little seasoning to the brew. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You can talk about that. And so then what we did is we took these elements and we treated it vibrationally and we came up with something called Wonder Water. Now, this is a rough bottle of it. I've had this bottle for for 10 years plus, And you're going to see right down here is a uh, magnet. So the magnet is charged with the same vibrations of what we found in the forest. And of course, our viewers will recognize that most everything that we do, and you can't see that too well, has a sigil on it. So there's the magnet and there's the sigil. And it sits in the window and it charges itself. So it's never ending. You just pour more water in there. It's never ending. And it's the same vibration as when we first did it. And the reason is, uh, many of you, you're in the process of ascension, but you just kind of keep hitting a ceiling. You can't get any further. That's because this band is blocking us from further growth and ascension. But what this vibrational product did, and no, it's not for sale, is that it pinged us at a higher level. So this was higher than our normal level, and it certainly went past this blocked area. And so it kept pinging in us, ping, 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 until finally our regular body said, hey, 
Something wants us to move up, upwards. And so that's what we've been doing. And we did this back in 2012. And I'm still alive. Now, one of the things that we notice, we do share this with people, that uh, people would say that their feet get nice and smooth, that where they have calluses on their heels, the first thing they notice is that the calluses are gone. I notice it. My feet are all smooth. Um, even people who don't even know what this is, they go, oh, that's great. I take a swig every day and I don't have calluses on my feet. Douglas, explain, please, and I'll get off the screen why that would be. Well, also, there are many people who have reported to us that uh, we give this to very close friends. One lady had scoliosis in her back since she was all bent up and bent over and she took it. She had that since her childhood and she took it and she was healed. Another lady whose husband was like on the deathbed, every day she would sneak it into his coffee. He'd be able to get out of bed. And if and she tested this and when she, he didn't know he was, if she was putting it in his coffee. And when she didn't put it in his coffee, he couldn't get out of bed. And so we've already seen a lot of people uh, have reactions to this and we know that it works. Uh, why the meteorite? Because of the iron. Because the iron and silica are the basis of your I am, as John was making reference to earlier, that's in, in your blood and we're strengthening that. But what it is in the uh, sequoia, now this is where it gets a little strange. There's a second story, a second chapter to this. Because once Tyla and I went there, and mind you, look at the, I don't know, 30 years, however many years it was that I tried to find this, tried to figure it out, until the right person came along, I didn't understand who I was in relationship to planting that forest and why it was planted. But once I met Tyla, and she says, no, she's a person of, uh, she's a mover and doer. She says, we're going to do this. I'm like, oh, well, I've tried for years, but, you know, okay, fine, I'll try again. I had no hope that we would find uh, sequoia sap in that condition. And basically, I don't talk about this. I seldom have ever talked about this because where did it come from? It came from a voice in my head speaking to me from sequoia trees. Really? That's, oh, okay. So uh, then we figured out uh, by being with each other and uh, lots of research that it was Emperor Yu, the Yellow Emperor in China, who sent us on the expedition. And he sent it there to try to replicate what he had already found from an ancient tree that had been growing in China that is um, a tree of life. It was called the ginseng tree. Well, there's no ginseng tree. So this is a tree of life. And, and other, other trees that grew the, the peaches of immortality. And so when you merge them together, that is what Emperor Yu thought was the elixir of life. It didn't work. And then he tried mercury, and that actually shortened people's lives. So then he sent an expedition of his best botanists to go to this land that they had already discovered in the West, which was basically America. And they, if you want to read about this, it's in the oldest written record in human history that we have. It's called the Legends of the Mountains and Seas. And then if you merge that with a story called Journey to the West, then you find out what it is that was the original historical impulse. And then after that, I did more research with some of the people who grow these things and the best botanists in the world and basically worked out with them how it was that these trees were crossbred. The sequoias were crossbred with metasequoias, with uh, later Sitka, and then redwood, uh, coastal redwoods, and then with bristlecone pine, and then with foxglove pine. And in the end, they have now found just recently, after we had developed this thing from the speech of the trees, they have discovered that what we had found was true. And that is how these trees came about. And they were planted in 2700 BC about, but time is different back then. I don't I wanna make very clear about that. So uh, we traveled to America, Tyler and I, and we were looking for this legendary tree of life, as it more or less was called in this ancient book. And we realized that we found all these trees because these were natural trees in America. Metasequoias were already in America, but it had to be crossbred. And these groves, each of the 30 groves of sequoia trees were hand planted. And they were planted in a little bit different area to, for experimental purposes. But in the end, Emperor Yu never got his formula. 
because the trees weren't old enough to produce mature sap. So this it, previous incarnation, and you'll hear people talk about their previous incarnations, usually they aligned themselves with Mary Magdalene, Mary, you know, John the Baptist, so on and so forth, you know, very big name people. Well, these weren't big name people. And so as this unfolded, I realized that it was true because I had been striving to understand this for the longest time since I was 17 years old. And it couldn't happen until I met the person that opened up that doorway to previous incarnations. And then that opened up some of the wisdom that came with it. And so if you want to hear the whole story, you can read chapter one and two of the uh, Immortal Love is the name of the novel that we're writing together. And it is also going to highlight other incarnations because Tyler and I have been together quite some time now and more and more connections to the past have come. But you don't need to travel to the place. You don't need to find one of your cells from a previous incarnation or go to your tomb or go to your casket. Believe me, I've tried all that. <laughs> uh, and it doesn't help. <laughs> Matter of fact, it can make it much, much worse. What you need to do is realize that love is eternal and it goes from life to life. And you're always drawn to that cluster of your spiritual friends because of spiritual gravity. And so that's why Tyla from Florida, me from Missouri, ended up here with John and Brian, who I met in Amherst long before I ever came to Detroit, and Bob, who I met uh, coming through Detroit long before I ever moved to Detroit. And then look at the other people who clustered here. Most of those people were not from Michigan. They were only here for a minute to create these spiritual gravitational ties, and then they are spread out. They spread out all over the world. <laughs> Absolutely. And so there's a certain dynamism when, when you uh, work with others. And so Christ said, whenever two or more are gathered in my name, I am in the midst of them. So when you have spiritual researchers coming together, there's a dynamism that just, it, you can't pull it together on your own. And beyond that, there's also that element of beauty that, that Douglas pointed out. And that's really uh, critically important. And I sent a little comp compilation that I put together uh, just the other day where Rudolf Steiner, again, I've mentioned this before, but you have that that wisdom, strength, and beauty as the three temples in the, the temple of the master builders. And so you have that idea of being able to take that wisdom and then have the courage to be able to put it forward like St. Paul. And that what you're doing is to be able to bring it out in an artistic way to be able to make it appealing is to contribute towards the future evolution of yourself and of the earth as a whole. And so you have all these people out of Rudolf Steiner's work. What are they doing? They're artists. We know people all over the world. I was just communicating with somebody in Hong Kong who's doing leisure paintings in Waldorf schools in Hong Kong. And, and then people in New Zealand. And pe we know people all over the world that are creating uh, works of beauty and so that's that's what we're striving to do here is to be able to get people working in a dynamic way to be able to incarnate this Christ impulse. Oh, yes. And at night uh, we can meet. And a lot of times that's how you get together with your spiritual friends through spiritual gravity, spiritual magnetism. But um, when you then meet them in person, something else happens. Now, Rudolf Steiner actually gives some practices that you can do. Uh, I am a little reluctant to uh, share them with you. They do work, and it's something that I'd learned before I'd ever studied anthroposophy. Uh, it's just a way to look at people, and then you can look um, through them, and then you can look at them from the outside, like, you know, from the inside out. So there's a way that when you're looking at somebody, especially someone that you've had a previous incarnation with, that you can stare into their eyes. And Rudolf Steiner then describes that something will change. And that is that all of a sudden you may reach the threshold of fear. Now try this, even with your beloved. Get close, real close, sit, look in their eyes. What happens? If you continue to stare, the person becomes extremely uncomfortable. 
and pretty soon an element of fear. And also because you're looking at the other person and you're not talking, they're looking at you. So you're seeing yourself through their eyes as well as, you know, um, all kinds of emotions come in. And then pretty soon you don't just look at their eyes. You're seeing multiple faces and multiple eyes. Many people have done this in a mirror and become terrified because they light a candle and they do this. And then when they get to stage one, which is simply looking at the astral body, it's going into dream and you can go into a dream. And when you do things become, as you know, chaotic and they start moving and they don't, and they can become fearful. So people aren't even ready to go to stage one. They're not even ready to look into the eyes of another person continuously and quietly without speaking because it will terrify them. But once you go beyond that, a strange thing happens. All the eyes become one eye. And now you're looking at a cyclops in front of you and you're going, okay, this is totally, totally weird. So when people are saying they're scared of these beasts that I keep talking about the threshold, well, you can do this instantaneously and find out whether or not you have the courage to face the threshold. And most of us don't. Uh, and he says, courage is the number one thing you have to have. So when your beloved or the person you're looking into their eyes, and that's why in Sufi dancing, people trip out, right? Because you're staring into their eyes and singing to them and telling them you love them and doing all these wonderful gestures and dancing with them and holding that. But all that staring in their eyes can get very frightening. Uh, and even staring in your own eyes can get frightening. But then once that happens, then you can see the whole room. You see the aura around them. And then you see the whole room looking at them. So when you're looking at someone's aura, you're not looking at their aura. You're in the room around them, looking at them from the outside, from the back and upside down. Now, I know that sounds crazy, but that's what you have to do if you want to understand somebody's previous incarnation with you. Yeah. Part of the challenge is to develop your peripheral vision, to be able to pay attention to all of this out here. And if you work with that, you will begin to see uh, some people, it depends. Uh, some of it has to do with your diet, unfortunately, and the bad habits that people have, like drinking, that can, can curtail some of the good effects. But in looking at that peripheral vision, you get into the habit of doing that, you can begin to see auras, especially for people uh, that that you know that actually have a significant aura like like my my friend Maruga you know he, I used to see the purple sparkles in his aura before he even walked through the door you know so some people that are doing spiritual work there it's going to be easier to be able to observe that but in getting into this communication with the trees mind you the father of modern science is Paracelsus the alchemist and he uh, came up with foxglove, which is the source for digitalis, which they use for, as a heart remedy. And he knew that through the types of, of procedures that Douglas is talking about here. So this is an age-old way of being able to get close to nature and learn the secrets of nature. You know, there's what's called signatura rerum, the signature of things. Absolutely. Now, another component of this, because someone asked me today, you know, how do you prepare for this kind of perception? Ritter Steiner gives these exercises. It's called the after image exercise. If you take a white piece of paper and you put a big red dot on it and you stare at it for two minutes and then you look away to the, just the white part, what will you see? The opposite color. If you stare at that opposite color, you'll see it's very luminous and it's the opposite of green, uh, opposite of red, and it will uh, essentially look as if it's alive and it's moving. And the longer you can hold that image, the after image, which is the opposite image of what you just saw in terms of color, and now you're not looking at it, but now you're looking at an after image, the longer you can hold that after image, the more power you will develop to be able to perceive the unseen. And of course, you're going to start off with, uh, you know, if you read Knowledge Fire Worlds, it'll talk about seeing the different colors of somebody's aura from their chakras. And if you really want to look at chakras, that is the one way that you can uh, strengthen the ability to do so. But none of that will work if you don't have moral development. 
because you're just going to get all confused because there's multiple levels. So you may think one level is another level. Well, at the astral is the etheric or the etheric is the astral or the astral is the physical. Oh, no, no. You have to know where you're at when you're perceiving these things. And so if you were looking at somebody doing that exercise I talked about before, where also Rudolf Steiner says, when you meet someone, uh, before you touch them, don't shake their hand. Look at them. And if you see that they're wearing a different set of clothes than they should be wearing for this time period, you might be seeing an after image of a previous incarnation. So let's say I go to meet John and John has on the outfit of a warrior and it, he's, he's got a red cross and a red cross tunic and he's got this big old sword. And I look at it and I go, wait, that's what the Templars carried. I may get the impression the first time that I see him before I have any encounter with him, who he is by simply looking at the image that comes that seems like it's just some crazy image. And then he says, Steiner says, look down at yourself because you're only going to see this with people you've probably, you have had past incarnations with unless you are completely, you know, a, a born or trained psychic clairvoyant that can read into the physical. So you look down in your own body and you see what you're wearing. And he literally says this, and it's a very strange thing. He says that, and for instance, you see the sword hanging in John's room there? That's a Templar sword. I can tell you right now, I can barely see it, but I can tell you that's a Templar sword. Okay, well, that's the same thing with all weapons. And for the garb that you might wear, it might tell you when you were with that person. But of course, what do we do? As soon as we meet somebody, we shake their hand, that's that. Yes, and just to add uh, another level of interest is that uh, when I was still in high school, my band, The Sleepless Nights, with a K, uh, recorded a, a tune about the Crusades. I mean, you know, why would a kid do that? You know? and, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's it's interesting. And then when I start researching my family, I find that, that one of my ancestors is the brother of uh, a knight that was in the first crusade and he was beheaded at Antioch. And uh, so that's a very significant city for a lot of the people in our little circle of friends, you know, is the city of Antioch. And so these things can all come together, but don't get carried away with it. Just have a, a, a detached a uh, sense of interest, and, and you will find more comes to you. If you start becoming self-important, you'll lose track of everything and start to, to come off the rails. But yes, yes, uh, we have these interesting impressions that we can receive if we are disinterested in the right way and allow uh, Christ to be the, the uh, he's the guy that, that he is the absolute of which we are uh, finding wonder, awe, and reverence about. It, it's about trying to learn more about Christ that you find more about yourself. Rudolf Steiner also gives a few other exercises. And so there is kind of uh, an insinuation that you might need to know these things, but let me tell you, it doesn't help in my experience. Uh, I now know uh, through different experiences that Tyler and I've had at different times over the years, all of a sudden a new experience shows, holy moly, look, is, it, is this telling us that we were together at, at this period of time because of what we just both witnessed here together, which is, by the way, seeing into the unseen world and how in the world can, you, can we know this? And then you have to research and research. There's an experience we had years ago uh, where we were basically, one of us was taken up into heaven while the other one had, was taken down uh, into the subnature world. And uh, after that, what we experienced in that exact environment had been prepared by other people for years, and yet it gave us then the symbols to realize another incarnation. And then I'll also throw out this before I give you these two other ways where Steiner says you can enhance your ability to understand your connection to people in previous incarnations is that another incarnation, which 
I didn't know this. It took, uh, it was only after the thing with the sequoia trees uh, became very evident that I realized that um, who, I, I don't know who I, who I was in that incarnation, but I know that I was one of two people. And I also know that Tyler was the other person. So you can get pictures. And now those pictures have been given to me since childhood. And I've gone to those places and literally tried to <laughs> snatch back some of the, uh, the energy from those incarnations or build on it or whatever I thought I was doing at the time, which was probably stupid. But when the insight came, it then showed me that what I had thought for all my life was wrong. And that was the other person. So I was seeing a person through the eyes and I thought I was that person. Well, hello, it took me, <laughs> took me 50 years to realize if I was looking from somebody else's eyes, then I wasn't that person. They, it was the opposite. And this opened up a whole other new thing, which has just been it's still coming in. And I still don't know what quite, quite to make of it. But eventually, there's going to be, well, we've already started the story on uh, our incarnation in Constantinople. And then we'll be writing about an incarnation in Prague and then an incarnation in America again. And how do we know these things? Um, I'm not sure that you, that they're intuitions. And so you believe that because an intuition is always inherently correct or else you wouldn't get an intuition and intuition has with it action. And so there's a reason why all of these things were revealed to me in the time that they were revealed. And that's the point. You can't rush this. You can't think that you can go to see some psychic reader and the psychic reader is going to tell you who you were together with your wife in the past incarnation. Rudolf Steiner said, you know, if some of you in the audience knew who you were to each other in a previous incarnation, you would be quite surprised because, and I don't remember the exact words he said, but he, said, but he indicated that essentially some of you are people who've cut off the head of the other. In other words, you've married the person who killed you in a previous incarnation. And literally, he says, cut off your head. So you you may, for instance, if I see somebody in their, their, in the card system, you know, this card system that we've talked about so much. If I see somebody in their, in their line as a Mars card, one of two things. <laughs> First off, they're going to be sexually attracted to them like crazy. You ought to talk about spiritual magnetism. You meet your Mars card. Matter of fact, I once told you this, John. Remember, we were, at a, we were at a party, and I said, I can choose, I can pick my Mars card out of this audience, right? And you said, that's not possible. And I did it twice in a row. We actually made a bet. Do you remember that? Both those uh, young ladies became my hair cutters, my dear friends, and at never, you know, I didn't have a relationship with them, but I was able to, why? Because we were at a Halloween party, and everybody shows who they really are at a Halloween party. So I just walked around dressed up as I really am, which as you might remember was always crazy. And I would just look at somebody looking at me and I'd say, yep, there's my Mars card. Because why? They, I probably killed them or they killed me in a previous incarnation. And we were very sexually attracted. So sex and violence are ruled by Mars. So you have to be really, really careful with all this stuff or you could be going the wrong direction thinking you're going the right direction. Kind of like this picture, you could take a long <laughs> walk off a short pier. <laughs> Keep in mind, uh, two of the greatest astronomers of all time, uh, Johannes Kepler and Tycho de Brahe, were both astrologers. So uh, if, if you're critical because you don't have the concepts that are necessary to be able to understand how it could be, that you actually have a relationship to the cosmos, uh, you might start there because uh, it's, it's an interesting thing in that uh, what uh, Kepler in confronted with astrology, he went and he investigated it and he said uh, the influence of the, uh, the imparted by the sublunar realms has compelled my unwilling belief. So in other words, he tried to disprove it and he couldn't do it. <laughs> and so that there is that, and that doesn't mean you're going to become an astrologer. That just that means that you should be more open 
to the idea that you're a part of the cosmos. You're not separate from it. And that fear element, that is that realm of the kidneys. And you can go, you could drop down to that. You're, when you get down to that lower triad of chakras, it gets a, a little bit dicey. You, you were supposed to have already worked that out in previous incarnations. And within spiritual science, we work with the, the, the heart chakra, the throat chakra, and the brow, and the rest can take care of itself. So you don't need to get into exotic, uh, strange tart, tantric practices and create all these strange warmth beings that are going to give you strange uh, dreams and all of that. People think that's the same and they like that it's become popular, but it's it, once they get across the other side and they realize the mess that they probably created, they'll, they may, might be regretting some of those ventures that they go on. But uh, this story just gets more interesting and more interesting and more interesting. But keep in mind, I would recommend reading uh, the, the Principle of Spiritual Economy lecture cycle by Rudolf Steiner, because you can find that you think you're an incarnation of a, a certain person, and maybe you're only bearing an imprint of their etheric body or their astral body, and it's not your ego is not that person, but yet you have this imprint because when uh, vehicles are developed to a high degree, they're, they're not dissolved. They are maintained in the spiritual world and can be used as a means of conveying intelligence to the cosmos. And so that you could incarnate, for example, uh, like uh, that Rudolf Steiner gives in his karmic relationship series, he gives some examples of that. But I don't want to go too far with this because uh, we can get lost in the weeds, but the principle of spiritual economy, it's available here on YouTube, and you can also go to the Rudolf Steiner archive and find it. It's fascinating. Yes, and uh, to reiterate again, uh, if you need to prepare yourself to meet the threshold, and it's uh, you're looking across the threshold when you're looking at somebody's previous incarnation, then uh, read the con condensed version of Life Between Death and rebirth, because that's where you go every night when you sleep. It helps you wake up. It helps you understand the spheres and the beings you're dealing with, and so on and so forth. So, you know, Rudolf Steiner uh, giving us so many indications on how it is that we can look into the past incarnations. Um, for instance, in his life, there was a book written where he had given poems to Ida Wegmann that indicated that they were together in some previous incarnations. That is still being fought over viciously at this point by anthroposophists, because who cares? I mean, do you, does it really matter who you were in a previous incarnation? It's, in my experience, if you knew, it would harm you, because you try to build on the old instead of building the new. And if you have not resolved something from the past incarnation, guess what? you're still in that incarnation. So when I'm looking at somebody and they say, yeah, oh, do, you, do you know why this illness has happened? I said, would you mind if I look deeper into your physical body? And they'll say, no, go ahead. And then I'll say, okay, all the things I just told you, all the things that you're doing that are really harming you, you've been doing that for many incarnations. And that's the way it works. We're so slow to learn. And just because you worked it out in one incarnation doesn't mean you're going to have it worked out in this incarnation. Just because you developed a capacity in a previous incarnation does not mean you're going to have that capacity in this incarnation. So really, what good does it do you? It Here's the only good that I can figure out that it does for you. To realize that, first off, people think they're soulmates. Yeah, okay, you probably have two dozen soulmates. But there's sometimes, sometimes one spirit mate. Rudolf Steiner and the person I just mentioned were supposedly incarnated multiple times together, and they work together very, very closely. I just mentioned that Tyler and I have probably, or at least we uh, believe that's the direction we're being led, have been together in multiple incarnations, okay? So what good does that do? Well, it demonstrates immortal love. It demonstrates what Swedenborg Carl called conjugal love, that there are souls and spirits that are so connected together that uh, they'll find each other again and again, no matter how far apart on the earth they were incarnated, they'll get together. 
no matter how many difficulties the demons put in the way to stop you from meeting that person, you'll still get together. And in the end, you have to kind of wonder if you had any free will, since your spiritual magnetism has brought you back together with certain individuals over and over again. But Rudolf Steiner points out, we always incarnate with our spiritual group. So here in Detroit, it's the spiritual group that I remember very clearly from being in Prague. And I believe that I know who some of those people were. Uh, but as I said, in that incarnation, I got so confused. I thought I was the opposite person than, than my beloved. So what does it do? It shows you that you're immortal. It shows you that love, spiritual gravitation, whatever you want to call it, spiritual magnetism, is more profound than death. Yeah, and just for those of you that are wondering, the title of the Swedenborg book is Conjugal Love. And so it, that's the idea of coming together with somebody who is, is so compatible that it becomes a spiritual quest. Uh, you could think of uh, Novalis and Sophie von Kuntz, for example, that that was a, a that was a divine relationship. There was there was a, a spiritual import. Unfortunately, she died before uh, they were able to be married, but she became like a tutelary spirit of, of uh, Novalis, that it was an inspiring spirit for him. And he himself attributed the creativity that poured forth and hymns to the night and all of his wonderful poetry, that it was the relationship with Sophie von Kuntz, this, this young girl who, who she was when he was just a young man. And he'd always, always thought that they would be married and it could never happen because she died. And so these things are, are tremendously inspiring. We can see the way they've influenced the destinies of great individuals. You know, you can look at, at some of the composers and their, and their, their mates and all that. It, it, uh, Schubert and his wife, Clara. I mean, she, she was as uh, much of a virtuoso as him. Imagine the relationship that they had writing that incredible music together that was greater as a result of their relationship. And so I just want to acknowledge the great relationship that Douglas has with Tyler. That It's definitely symbiotic and that you can become a multiplication of what you thought you would be without. And so with that being said, I don't want to go over long, but Douglas has another uh, thing to share here. Because, you know, I say I'm going to talk about something, then when I don't, people get upset with me because uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's like I don't have a memory. But yes, uh, I was dying when Tyla met me, and I was happy if I would have died. But uh, since then, she has encouraged me to write 10 books, 25 e-books, about 150 articles in 2000. Encouragement, I would say, if you want a dinner tonight, what did you say? <laughs> so they call it, they call it a cattle prize. <laughs> <laughs> no, because we're old. We we only have a short period of time That's on right. earth. We got to get all this written down. And yep, part of our now story, when part of our story is our uh, relationship with you and Barbara, because that all t all together it tells the story, and we tell the story. We want you to hear. Douglas's autobiography so that you can begin to see how your own spiritual journey might unfold and you're not crazy. That's right. <laughs> so uh, yes, without her encouragement, it's called feeding me, <laughs> dressing me, uh, doing my hair, making sure I'm still alive, it being my doctor. These days, ladies? Oh, yeah, boy. Yeah, it, the yeah, hair, yeah, that's that. all her. And yeah. so I would have been dead a long time ago and I'd written two pathetic books before I met her. And uh, now the work that we've done is 2,000 podcasts, okay? Uh, I would have done none of that. Uh, I would have just been lazy. And now I want to explain two more things. Steiner said there's two ways that you can figure out who people are in the past. So if I'm looking at Tyla and I want to know who she is, I say, what is her most characteristic gesture? Gesture, not speech, gesture. And then you walk, watch her walk from behind. Watch her walk from standing in front of her and look at her gesture. Then at night, you pray to the planet Saturn to please tell me who this woman is. And then you ask for the answer from the moon when you wake up in the morning. And if you do that over and over and over and over and over again, you may be given some insight 
Uh, now that's not what I did. I didn't try to figure that out with, with Tyla. It, it just, you know, it just, as things were evolving, I kept seeing new parts of myself that she was helping uh, open up because that's how we find out who our ego is through others. And as those opened up, I'm going, but wait, you were there too. You couldn't have told me this if you weren't there. You couldn't have opened up or seen this part of me if you weren't there. So when you meet the right person and they're your spirit mate, then they can, uh, it can be helpful to know uh, your relationships in the past, but do not let that burden you and do not let that be the limitation or your expectation. Now, keep in mind, he, he's mentioning Saturn and the moon, okay? Saturn has a 28-year cycle about, and the moon has a 28 or thereabout cycle. So there's a certain of harmonic days. relationship. Yeah, of days. And so you have that harmonic happening there between Saturn and the moon. And with that being said, this is a wonderful journey, and I can't thank Tyla enough because if she hadn't... Uh, Pulled out her her cattle prod and got these. I tell you old, why. Tell us that he wanted rolling. to write his autobiography. I said I can't edit another word. I'm done. <laughs> you can speak it into the microphone, and I'll get a professional to interview you. Exactly. John, thanks so much. Oh, I you make it all this happen. So much. God thank bless you, John. all of you, and we'll see yep. you the next time. And and if thank you, you have my... any questions about Love you guys. water, leave it in the comments section, and we'll do a special video on this. But we need to know what kind of questions you would have.